guys are awesome. You guys been here since 10 o'clock this morning. And you guys still sitting down, your butt ain't burning up so far. I'm excited to be here today. You know, you probably been looking at me and saying, man, you got a good suit on. But why in the world are you barefoot? You're going to mess up something real good. But the reason why I'm barefooted today is because the World Health Organization says over 2 billion people in our world will never be able to afford a pair of shoes. You know, to us in this country, a pair of shoes is a fashion statement. But to the millions of kids all over the world, here's their primary mode of transportation. It's an instrument to help save their lives. You know, we're talking about dreamers, dream makers, and risk takers today. But that reminds me of a quote that I heard a while ago that says, in life, as we go through our journey, the reality is, sometimes we may choose to love, but we run the risk of maybe not being loved in return. Some of you may choose to hope, but the reality when we hope sometimes is very painful. We run the risk of feeling those pain. And sometimes we choose to try, but when you try, you run the risk of failing. But the reality is we have to continue to always take risk in life because the greatest hazard and omission is life is when we choose not to risk anything at all. And I want to challenge you guys to keep risking and to keep dreaming big because I believe Every single one of us has the power of what it takes to change this world. You know, as we talk about, how's my stuff going here? <laughs> and you guys go real fast. But the reality is, one of the quotes that I miss, it talks about the power of one. The story I'm going to share with you today is the story of what happens when you choose to leave your comfort, to go, tr go try and help make a difference. Because the reality is, my wife always tells me, what if the odds are a million in one that we should choose to be that one? And I want to challenge you, one of my favorite people, one of my heroes and role models, a lady by the name of Dr. Maya Angelou. I met her in New York a few years ago. And I asked her, we said, who's your role model, Dr. Angelou? She said, is this gentleman by the name of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I said, why? And she said, because he exhibited courage. Because she said, every human virtue in life stems from courage. That whatever it is that you do, you should choose to be courageous. And then I got excited. Because if you realize what that courage meant, he had to take me back to my roots. Because as you see me today, you see me dressed in this nice suit. I was one of those little kids. You probably you have been watching on Discovery Channel many years ago. So kids that used to live in my neighborhood used to pray this prayer. God, give me 001. Know what that means? It's okay if you don't give me breakfast. It's okay if you don't give me lunch, but give me supper so I can at least make it till tomorrow. See, I grew up in a home where I didn't have shoes. I used to be one of those little boys you used to see on Discovery Channel carrying basket to go sell water at parks where people used to play soccer, volleyball, or basketball. Well, I had a date with destiny. Because over 30 something years ago, there was a group of missionaries that came to my country on the western part of Africa called Nigeria. And these people brought this little orange ball. I found out later on they call them basketballs. You got to realize, you know, if you're going up in Africa, if you didn't start around, we kick them, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I didn't realize that they dribble them balls. So I went there that day to go sell water. And I didn't realize my life was about to change. Because as I saw those people in this corner playing with these little kids with these orange balls, I, got, I gravitated towards them. And then I realized they were having some fun. So I put down my basket. I said, I'm about to join in this party. And you should have said, have you ever seen anybody trying to corral cats? <laughs> trying to teach African boys how to play basketball. They've never seen basketball before. <laughs> and then we started it. I put my basket, my, my basket down. We tried to teach us how to dribble and teach us how to shoot baskets. And we were having a lot of fun. And I was blessed that day. And guess what happened? They chose to do a contest. And the price of that contest was a pair of shoes. Man, I wasn't even supposed to be there because those kids that were playing basketball to us today said, get away, go sell your water. I was just trying to be part of the club. <laughs> and they selected me. And guess who won that contest? Yours and truly. <laughs> and when that young man from Wisconsin, his name was David, came, and he brought this two, this brand new pair of tennis shoes, you could have thought he was giving me gold. And he looked me in the eye and said, Manny, just because all you see around you is poverty, doesn't mean your creator has forgotten about you. He said, you keep dreaming, and you keep dreaming big. He could have told me that day that the sky was green. I would have believed him. 
I ran so fast, I forgot my basket right there. <laughs> I took my shoes home. I got home. Mama said, where the water? I said, Mama, look at my shoes. <laughs> Mama was so excited for me because the reality is where I grew up in, it wasn't all that pitchy. Because my father was an alcoholic. All I ever heard from my father is I'll never amount to anything. But I always thank God for a godly mother that always believed in me. Because I always wonder, Mom, why do I always have to live with poverty? And every so often, my mom would do this to me. She would take me by the window. She said, son, I want to look outside. What do you see? And I'll ramble. I said, mom, I see, I see the trees. No, son, I want to look higher. What do you see? I said, mom, I see. I see the birds. Son, son, I want to look higher. What do you see? And I said, I see the clouds. She always said, son, you ever wonder why God created the sky so high? And I said, I don't know, mama. She said, so poor boys like in good dream, real high. He said, son, never make excuse for life. And I started doing things that I knew to do. I, when things got hard at my house, guess where I used to go hang out? At the basketball court. Then I heard a rumor that if you eat a lot of beans, you get tall. <laughs> I started eating beans like beans was going to go out of style. <laughs> you know what happens in the house with people that eat beans. <laughs> I started eating beans. And I started to learn how to shoot. And as I got better, I finished high school. And my dream was to go to America to go play basketball. And I got the chance to get scholarships. Here's where I always pause when I share my story. Because every time you think the creator of the universe that created me, that I knew I was from Nigeria, could have sent me to a place like San Diego, California. Or you would have said, man, that guy deserves a little bit of punishment. Let me send him to Houston, Texas or something. <laughs> or maybe one of my favorite places in the world, maybe Phoenix, Arizona. Guess where he sent me to? To North Dakota. <laughs> I tell you, North Dakota is the coldest place in the world. <laughs> Africa people don't belong in North Dakota. Because I realized that real fast. Because I said, what did I do, God, to deserve this? And I went to school, finished school in North Dakota. And as I finished my undergrad, I went to get my master's. And I was a sucker for punishment. I stayed at North Dakota State. <laughs> Some guy said, son, don't you know what the weather almanac is? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. I finished high school, I finished my graduate school, and I got the chance to go join this conference, was selected as one of the top 30 students in the country to go to San Diego, finally. <laughs> and I got to San Diego, I met this young man, I owned a company in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he approached me. He said, do you want a job? I said, yes, I want a job. I said, where's the job? He said, Charlotte. I said, where's Charlotte? Because <laughs> I wasn't about to get tricked the second time. So he flew me to Charlotte, North Carolina in November of 1995. I landed at Charlotte Douglas Airport. It was 75 degrees. <laughs> you got to realize when I left Fargo, North Dakota, it was 45 below zero. <laughs> so they offered me a job on the spot. So I said, well, let me think about this for a minute. And I said, we, I pray about decisions like this. I was winking on the inside. So I went around the corner, called my wife. I said, honey, I know we pray about a lot of stuff, but this one, we're just going to move. And ever since, I've been living in Charlotte. <laughs> and I went, joined this technology company as a product manager to build software to help improve efficiency around logistics and supply chain. And that company got acquired. I was living the American dream. I joined a new company in New York. That one got sold, living the American dream. And then my father got sick because of the cirrhosis of the liver. And I went, ended up going back to Africa for his funeral. And I remember going to that little park where I grew up in, and I saw many of those children just like me. And they were destitute, hopeless. But there was one thing that was so resonant in me was the fact that to us that much is given, much is required. And I heard one woman, my mom told me once ago that with the measure in which we be blessed, we have responsibility to be a blessing. So it took me about five years to run because I realized what's about to happen. I was about to do something about the pain I just saw. I said, well, you got to realize I now live on the other side of Valentine. <laughs> I'm about to make a sacrifice here. And I got a wife that likes to shop. <laughs> and this is a little tough. But she was one of my greatest inspiration, the ones that challenged me to pursue the dream. And in 2003, left this company that we were in, living in, on those high incomes, doing the things that we all want to do to go study this organization called Samaritan's Feet with a vision to help inspire hope among some of the world's most impoverished children by helping to meet a basic need, a pair of shoes. 
And as I keep speaking, you know, you can read a little bit about that in my in our book titled Soul Purpose. You can go to our website and pick up one of those copies. But I want to share a little bit about what excites me so much about this. Next. 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 There you go. <laughs> because Samaritans is not just about providing shoes to the needy. Because we use the hope platform as a vehicle to help inspire hope. Because hope to us, the H stands for health. Because the reality, people don't realize this. Two billion people can't afford shoes. 300 million kids woke up this morning in the countries in which we serve that has no shoes on their feet. About a million of them will lose their life or lose their limbs this year because of soil transmitted parasites and foodborne related illnesses and diseases. And people don't realize that even in our country, there are families that have to decide between putting groceries on the table and providing shoes for their kids to go to school. I never thought my, the day will come that over 40% of our products would be in the United States. But our vision is to help inspire hope. We want to be able to help 10 million children over the next 10 years to provide shoes and a vehicle to be able to inspire them to keep dreaming and believing the impossible can become possible. Here's a footprint of where we've been working. All over the world, we've worked in over 62 countries, from Africa to South America to Caribbean, Eastern Europe, all across different parts of the Middle East. We work in cities all across the United States. Even my cousin in West Virginia, <laughs> then his shoes. People didn't realize this. But I didn't know that myself. But what inspired me, what got me all excited was the fact that I saw a need, I lived the need, and I can do something about that need. And that's what I want to challenge you guys here with today, that you guys can do something because one of my pastors told me once a while ago, he said, Manny, if you find a need in your community, you don't have to wait for somebody else. Everybody always said, that. I think that's for somebody else. But that somebody else may be you. That somebody else may be you. Maybe you're being called to do something about that need next because as Samaritans feed, people don't realize this. In a country like Ethiopia, for example, one of my favorite places in the world, they have this situation called podoconiosis. I don't even you think you've ever heard about this. It's a form of elephantiasis. I just invited one of my friends, the president of Burundi, that came to visit me two weeks ago. In his country, they have hundreds of thousands of people. In Ethiopia, over a million people are infected by podoconiosis. You know what the cure for that stuff is? Shoes. In my country, next slide, of Nigeria, over 42% of school-age kids over there, they're affected by this condition called cystosomiasis, this parasitic flea that affects us. You know, into guys, sorry, and cystosomiasis, and over 200 million people around the world are affected by this condition. People don't know this. You don't know about this because nobody has told you. Well, I've told you that today. Now you can help us do something about it because kids are losing their limbs and losing their lives because they have no shoes. And you might have seen on national TV, maybe you've seen on ESPN or CNN or some of this other stuff, we got coaches that coaches barefoot for us. You might have seen my dear friend over at Kentucky, Mr. John Calipari, with our shoes, or Brad Stevens over at Butler University. Maybe you've seen my friend at Georgia State with IUP, formerly with IUPI, or Al Major right here at UNCC, or your coach right here, Queens University. People that are choosing to use their platform to help make a difference. But here's why we are so successful, I believe, the reason why we do what we do. Next slide, please. I think the keys to our success has been focus, focus, and more focus. Because we believe our big, our big early audacious goal is to be able to impact 10 million children over the next 10 years. And over the last seven years, we've been able to impact 3.5 million people in over 62 countries around the world. Just because one person chose to come to Africa and show love and compassion to a poor African kid. Because of that, he chose, I'm gonna do something about it because my dream is that those 300 million children, none of them will lose their life because they have no shoe. And I know we can do that. You know, for as little as $10, now Samaritans they can make, distribute, and ship shoes to children all over the world for less than $10. You know, what we do just not just providing those shoes, but our teams of ambassadors literally will get on those dirty floors and spend about 7, 10, or 12 minutes with each child and look them in the eye and start washing their feet and putting shoes on them and reminding them that they can be anything that they want to be. That's what excites me. Because what it does to you, it's a mutually transformative experience. The one in which you're speaking at, or speaking to, and the one that's doing all the loving. Because I tell you, when you get up that seat, you just got surgery done to your heart. Because you just saw a need face to face. We bridge cultural and different types of lines. You should see the picture, the palette of 
white folks washing the feet of African-American kids. And, and in Africa, in different groups of people serving each other in the name of love, building bridges of peace and reconciliation. In a few days, I'm leaving for Peru to go work with the Minister of Justice and the Police General, where we're bringing together some of the toughest gangs in that country. And they're going to be using Samaritan feet as the vehicle in which to sign a covenant for peace and reconciliation and have those people wash each other's feet. So as I wrap up today, as I close, I know my time is up, but I want to challenge you guys. At Samaritan's Feet, our model is, I get emotional. Somebody did this to me many years ago. I mean, you can see some of our shoes in which we make ourselves, you know, hopefully as part of our new model, we'll be able to have this stuff available where you can actually buy one, give one away. But our model is we got to find a hurt in our community. We need to meet that hurt, find the pain, and help heal that pain. Because the reality is there are people that are struggling and suffering in the world, and we can do something about that. And my mom always tells me that, you know, I've gone through life, and I've seen people go days without food. I've gone through life, and people go hours, sometimes days without water. But she says she's never seen a soul survive a moment without hope. Because hope is one of those things that she always reminds me, she said, son, to have only positive expectations, regardless of what it is that you're going through in life. So I want to challenge you today. At the end of this, when it's all said and done, when your time is up on this earth, how will you be remembered? If for some reason you don't show up tomorrow, will anybody miss you? Thank you so much today, and God bless you.